Welcome back. Now, we just finished week one, and I would like for you to think about what you have learned during week one, because week one is the building blocks for all the rest of the sessions that we're going to have. So the kind of things that I'd like for you to have remembered and gathered from that first week is, one is that the pain is not in your head, but it is in, it's not in your imagination, but it can be in your head. And we had a chart that showed the different parts of your body that, uh, different parts of your brain that affected your pain. We talked about the thalamus and how the thalamus is like a switchboard that has all of the connections to your brain, knows how you're feeling and your experiences and your beliefs and how all of those things really uh, affects the, the intensity of your pain. We talked about uh, how uh, very few people become addicted to their pain meds, but how important it is for you to check with your doctor. We talked about how uh, pain patients uh, function, what, how, what our, our mind is like, that we, uh, we push ourselves. Uh, we don't know when enough's enough, but we've always given 150%. We defer to the needs of others, and we are prone to be really negative about ourselves. In fact, that negativity has been part of our ability to push forward and do better than our peers because we tell ourselves ghost stories. I hope you learned that in the last uh, uh, section of how to handle a pain crisis, how to get the information together uh, and know how long your pain lasts, how often you've had it so that you are better prepared mentally to go through a pain crisis. Now, and I hope you have um, uh, done your relaxation for the, this week and that you've done it a little more often than uh, just after each one of those five lessons. If you haven't, then I'd like for you to ask yourself, how come? You know, what got in the way? And if you, you know, the thing that we want to do in all, and throughout this course is to tell the brain the truth. So what is the truth? What's the truth that you didn't get around to doing the relaxation? I bet you if you put it on paper that you would have plenty of people that would agree that that needed to be done. So it's not frivolous stuff that you're doing, but maybe it's like what you've always done. Maybe there's things that always got ahead of you. You know, you've, you've, you've got this material together, you've wanted to do something about your pain, and yet you may find yourself putting other things ahead of it. I encourage you to carve out a space for yourself and that and prepare a space for you to listen to these DVDs and for you to work on this relaxation. Because while your pain can stop you temporarily, only you can do it permanently. Well, loving a hurt part means that you want to take care and treat that area of your body that's having this discomfort in the same way that you would treat a loved one who had your condition and your pain level. Now let's use the example of a sick child. You're awakened at three in the morning. The kid is in there throwing up. Got the place messed. He's crying, screaming. You got to go to work the next day. And you just got to bed at 1 o'clock, so you're tired, you're sleepy, you don't want to get up. And maybe you've even told the boy that not to even eat that before he went to bed. But now he's throwing it up, okay? So you get in there, 
and you got to clean that up. You get, your job is to get him back to bed or her back to bed and settle them down and so that you can get some sleep. How do you do it? Well, you know, if you go in there and you, you are irritated, even if you had a right to be irritated, but if you go in there and you're irritated, the kid is just going to get sicker. What do you do? Well, you go in and you're very calm, you're soothing, you're nurturing, you're not critical, and you clean the things up, you get them in dry clothes, you make them comfortable, you figure out what they need. That's what you're going after. What are you needing? So you may get them a drink, take them here. Uh, if they're scared, you take care of everything that they are needing and get them comfy again so they can go back to sleep. Anything other than being gentle with them and, and listening to what they need is just going to make the child sicker. Now I want you to think about that in terms of that part of you that is injured or has a pain condition. Do we do that? When we wake up at 3 in the morning, do we try to think what is the best thing? What, what is this pain asking? You know, what can I do to make it feel better? Who oh, no. Well, I don't. At least I haven't. I try, try to do better, but at times, you know, at 3 in the morning, I'm angry. I can't lay there in bed with my wife. I got to get up and sit in a, in a recliner. You know, I feel like I'm the only guy in the whole block that's up at 3 in the morning with back pain. And I don't like it. And I want everybody on my block to wake up and know it. I want everybody in my house to know it. You know, I want to broadcast it. Does that make my pain any better? No, it doesn't. What does? To treat it like you would treat a sick child. And not to get angry with it, not to be judgmental with it, not to fuss with it. You know, lots and lots of research has been done that shows clearly that when we're, when we're in a fit of anger, our pain tolerance goes down. So if you're going to be angry at your pain, you're just going to have more of it. But like the sick child, if you take care of it, if you're nurturing, if you're gentle, if you're trying to figure out what it is that's going on. Why is this hurting and what does it need? You know, just like the kid uh, wakes up at three in the morning, he's not doing, he or she is not doing that uh, just to mess with your life. They're not doing that because you're some unworthy soul that should be uh, punished. They're doing that because they're sick. And they're needing something that maybe you can provide. And their crying is a request for that attention. So what is it that when your pain starts coming up in the middle of the night, what is it saying? Same thing. It's you. It's not some villain that's come into your house to make your life miserable any more than then um, your child is wanting to make your life miserable. Oh, it's not fair. Not fair at all that you've got this pain that you're up at 3 in the morning. There's a lot of things that may, uh, you may be experiencing now that's not very fair. But think about it. You know, there are people who have ser close deaths. Would you trade it for that? Someone who dies in your family? Would you trade it for a limb? Some of you have a limb missing. Would you trade that limb for someone you loved? You see, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make here is things could be worse. It wasn't, it's not fair. And there's some people who have it, their luck is, is worse than yours. Pretty easy to, to find them. 
So it's not fair, but it is your situation. Now, the guy that wrote, uh, Kirshner, that wrote the book, um, Why uh, Bad Things Happen to Good People, the, the whole gist of that book comes down to a simple, uh, it has, it's not helpful to ask why this happened to me. But you ask, since it has, then what do I do about it? And this program is an attempt to teach you what you can do about it. Let me give you an example of a guy named Bill. Bill was in my very first group several years ago. Bill was a motorcycle enthusiast, rode dirt bikes, loved to catch air, um, you know, take chances. He was a pretty rough and tough sort of guy. Bill came to see me after he tried to run his truck off of a bridge because he just had it. He laid on a couch 24-7. Uh, if he got up to even put something in a dishwasher, he was up in an ER room uh, needing a shot. He lived on, a, on an acreage, and his father-in-law lived next to him. And the father-in-law would come over and mow his lawn once in a while. That would anger Bill, not at the father, but the fact that he couldn't do it. And what would he do? He would get out once in a while, and he would mow his whole lawn. Well, he'd be down. He'd be in an ER room. Well, when Bill came to these sessions, he thought that loving the hurt part meant that he was uh, declaring his weakness or that he was uh, um, being uh, coddling uh, his illness. He thought that, that if he gave in and began to pay attention to him and be gentle with his hurt part, that he would lose his motivation and would become a, you know, a laggard of some kind. Well, that's not true. And in the, in the 40 years that I've been doing this, I've never seen a doer become a laggard. The problem is you've got to get a doer to calm down enough to settle. Well, Bill began to practice uh, loving the hurt part. And what his goal was, was to mow his lawn. So what he would do, would get out and he would mow a lawn for a little while and then he would come back and sit down. He'd get up and go mow the lawn a little bit and he'd come back and sit down. Uh, and he didn't push himself too far. He listened to what the hurt part was saying. And when the hurt part was telling him that it's gone far enough, he would, he would rest it. Bill learned to be aware of any changes in his body as he started learning to relax. When he began to pay attention to the subtle changes in his muscles, he learned to tell when those muscles began to get tight and when it was time to relax them. Bill practiced these techniques and, and he began to be able to mow his whole lawn. That didn't happen overnight. It took him over uh, two seasons and in Oklahoma we, we mow a lawn maybe three months out of a year and in that one year he practiced and by the next year he was mowing his whole lawn without um, having to sit down. Why? Well, when you take it easy and you stay uh, active, your body, uh, as we talked about last week, stays in condition. And he put himself in better and better condition so he had more and more stamina. He could go further. And one of the techniques you see that Bill used is the technique of pacing. Now, pacing is not allowing your body to go more than two points up from where you start. Remember on a scale of zero to 10, with 10 being the worst pain imaginable? If you start out at, let's say, a five here, and it doesn't matter what you're doing, but 
when you get to a seven, you stop. That's pacing. Now, that means, stopping means laying the broom over. That means taking the hands out of the dishwasher. That means laying the saw down, laying the washcloth down. That means stepping away from the bed that you're trying to make. That means turning the vacuum cleaner off. That means stopping when that gets two points up. And then you go sit down and you sit there and you do whatever you have learned to do to get this pain level down to the original in that situation five. Get it back down two. When it gets down to two, you get up and you go back and do it. Now, you see, you got to learn when you pace. You got to learn it's not now but how. It's not now, but how. And how means two points up and you sit down till it goes back down. Then you're up again and you work on it. You see, the problem we have as doers is that we want to get it done in one fell swoop. And when we do that, we're laid up the next day. You've had that experience, I'm sure. And we want to reduce that because what you learned last week is that your body goes out of condition. You learned that those A-fibers just went to sleep. And when you got back up, those C-fibers were, they got up with you, but the A-fibers didn't. And so you're going to have more pain. The rule of two is going to get your body more and more in shape. And it may initially be rather frustrating for you uh, to take your hands out of the dishwasher, drop the, the cloth, uh, uh, lay the broom to the side, and go sit down, because maybe you've only had five minutes, maybe you've only had 10 minutes of activity before you have to do it. But if you follow this, there's very few guarantees I can make you, very few. But I can tell you this one, that if you follow this and do it every time, your stamina is going to increase. And maybe it's that five minutes is going to turn into 10. And the 10 will turn into 15. And pretty soon you've got that kitchen done. Pretty soon you've got the, the garage wa uh, swept out before you have to sit down. But you got to get there. You got to get yourself in condition. You know, something that may not quite be a guarantee I can give you, but I haven't seen too many situations that's different, is that when you overdo and you're down for two days, this is not a vacation. You're saying to most pain patients, including me, are saying very nasty things to themselves. Look at you. It, it seems as if to us it proves how disabled we are. Well, I can't even do that without having to be laid up for two days. Look at me. This is going to get worse. So you may have finished that kitchen. You may have finished that garage. Hey, and you feel good about it because that's the way it was. And uh, other in the other days before you got injured. But you're down for two days and that takes all of the good away. And it leaves you feeling empty and defeated. Now, so you want to look at your pain uh, as, your, as a sick child, a sick loved one. Another way of looking at it is look at your, your sick part as your partner in a sack race. You know, I don't know if you remember what a sack race is, but if you were in Boy Scouts, you put a gunny sack and everybody puts one leg in there, and then they run a race down, and you have to be coordinated with your partner here in taking that step. 
And if you're not coordinated, those who are not coordinating and working with their partner are on their face or on their rear. They don't make it to the finish line. Now, if you want to make it to the finish line, you got to work it out with that sick part. You need to love that hurt part and learn to coordinate with it. So remember, it's not now, it's how. Pacing gives you a sense of a, of a can-do if you don't overdo it. So you get a job done. You see, it's not now, but how? You get a job done. And you feel good about it. We all have learned that, that it's, it's good to, be, to have a job finished and feel like we've done a good job of it. We don't have to do it in one fell swoop. When we have enough of those can-dos, that develops a sense, uh, develops a belief system that we can function in spite of our discomforts. Now, great, interesting study was done where they took people who were in pain and they took, a, they found, they tested them all and they found out that there was a group over here that was depressed and wasn't functioning very well, pretty disabled. There was a group over here that, you know, they seemed to be functioning and they weren't very depressed. And so they're wanting to know what's the difference in the two. You know what they found? When they looked at, they took and uh, they took age out and race and the number of years. In other words, all of that was equal. The intensity of the pain, the number of years, the injuries, all of that was equal. The one thing that determined whether a group was going to be depressed and disabled was a belief. The group over here that was not depressed and was actually functioning, had the same everything except they had a belief. Now, how do you get a belief? You have a belief by practice and putting your heart into it. And that's what I'm encouraging you to do here is to practice these techniques, practice the pacing. Now, you got to watch out for that little devil up there that's going to be saying, well, I just take me five minutes more and I'll have this done and then I'll go sit down. That little old devil is with all of us. Watch that statement because it's in that five minutes that you're going to hurt yourself. You know, some other things that can do that would, might be helpful is uh, to... Uh, put a rubber band, wear a rubber band around your arm. Now, that's not to pop yourself with. All that is, is going to be, while you practice this week, pacing, put a rubber band around here, wear it. And that, all that says is, it, it reminds you to ask the question, if a loved one of mine had my pain and my condition would I ask them to do this that I'm thinking of doing? Now, the answer might be yes, because it needs to be done. But then the question is, how would I ask them to do it? Would I want them to push and get it all done in a matter of an hour? Would I want them to pace and take care of themselves? That rubber band is also to ask yourself, and then, when they do sit down, because I would want them to take a break if they started hurting a loved one of mine, what would I want them to say to themselves? Negative things? Or would I want them to be able to give themselves permission because this is good for them and they're learning a way of, of handling their pain? Now, those things that you say to yourself when you sit down, all those critical things, Everybody does that. And those are the negative thinkings that we talked about in the first week. You've got the skills now. You want to capture those. Now, a lot of them have to do around 
when you were a child around your chores and what your family felt or what you felt needed to be done around those chores. Now, as you figure out what those negative thoughts are and you put them with the uh, smart chart and you refute them, you want to tell, you, tell yourself then what is the reality. You do have a right to sit down just like you would want, just like you would say to your own daughter or son or loved one if they had your pain and your condition. You'd want them to sit down and rest. No, you're not lazy. Sit down. You're hurting. So what the rubber band is to help you to remind yourself to follow those uh, suggestions. The other thing is to get a, a calendar. And on those days that you have done jobs and you've done it in a pacing way, that that evening and particularly the next morning you're not hurting any more than you usually are, put an X on that day so that you can see yourself improving over time. The last thing I want to talk about today is a letter to your sick part. I'd like for you to write a letter to your sick part, a letter every week. Now, Another way of putting that is a letter to your, your sack race partner. And you're going to write a letter to this partner, who really is your sick part, about how well the two of you have been doing this week. Now, there might be some negative feelings about your partner. That's kind of normal. But you know, in reality, if you're going to fuss with your partner, it just not, you're not going to get to the finish line. So you've got to come, that partner is not there to make your life miserable. He's just there. And it may not be fair, but he's there. And unlike uh, marriages, unlike bosses, this is one of those partners that you're never going to get rid of. They're always going to be there. You've got to learn to relate to them. So this is Dr. Hawkins again. The, at the end of day one, you practice your relaxation, wear that rubber band, and, and just love the hurt part. And I'll see you next time.